All right, so Joshua chapter 3, and in the next few chapters, it's kind of going to be very similar. It, it's, we're not going to be doing every single verse going through each individual city because we read, we read the whole thing right now. And I'm going to be highlighting certain portions because there are areas that I want to hit for sure and, and things that are very interesting and I want to point out. But I'm going to spend the time fleshing out those things more than just reading through every single verse because there's a lot of that. And we're going to, we're, what you see here in Joshua chapter 13 is, I mean, really a lot, of it's, a lot of it's kind of repetitive in the sense that this is all stuff that Moses did. These are the battles that Moses fought, that Moses won. This was all like on the other side of Jordan. So were the, 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 the tribe of Judah and Reuben, the half-tribe of Manasseh, they got their inheritance already divvied up to them. And this is going over all of that again, because then in chapter 14 and 15, it's going to go over more into the other inheritance that's being divided up to the rest of the children of Israel. So this is kind of where we're at in Joshua. We, we went through all the battles. They highlighted all the victories. And now they're going into the division of the promised land. So we see that happening here, and he's just kind of um, reiterating and, and, and mentioning again, you know, all of the, the inheritance to these tribes that, that Moses won the battles when, when they fought on the other side of Jordan. But let's uh, start with verse number one. The Bible says, Now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into this. We covered quite a bit of this last week about how they make these lists. And even when you think you've done so much and you've done all this great work, there's still more to be done. We see that. But what I didn't really focus on too much last week was how old you know, Joshua is and, and the Lord is still telling him to do stuff. And we need to remember that even physically, and, I, and I, you know, I wish that the older generation would get this down, that their work is not done. You may retire from a job that you've worked at for 30 years or whatever as you're providing for your family, you work nine to five, and then you go into retirement. But you, when it comes to the work for the Lord, you never retire. You don't just sit back and kick back and take it easy and say, oh yeah, the soul winning, that's for the young guys or the, you know, all this, whatever. Like, I'll just pray. Now look, you ought to be praying. But if you have the physical capability, whether you're 8 or 80, you ought to be going out and, and doing what you can and preaching the gospel to every creature because that is what has been committed unto us and there is no greater job than giving the gospel to people. Now, you may, you, things change throughout your life. My, my eight-year-old's not going to go out and knock on doors by herself. She's not allowed to. No matter how much she may want to, she's not allowed to. So she's going to have to go with a parent or with some, you know, someone older. She's going to have to go out with us. When she becomes an adult, hey, go ahead. You know, knock on as many doors as you can. She gets married, do whatever, you know, as much as your husband's going to allow you to do. When she, um, when, when they get older, when, you know, when any of us get older, things happen. Your bodies aren't able to do as much. Right now, you know, there's a room full of a lot of young people. We're able to go out and you could work all day. You could go out and spend 10 hours sewing and just really put in a long day. And yeah, you're exhausted at the end, but your body can, can keep up with it and you can do it. But when you start getting up there in years... You may not be able to do it physically, but you do what you can do because there's always more work to be done. And just because you're young or just because you're old or just because you have this condition or that condition doesn't mean that God's saying, well, no, there's no work for you to do. Because if there's, no, if there's really no work for you to do, you wouldn't be here. And, and we have, it's a, it's a problem. It's a serious problem. It's a problem either with the culture or with the old. I don't, I don't know where it all stems from, but I do notice there's kind of a lack of the older generation in the newer churches, in the new IFB churches. The ones who are actually doing something. The ones who are actually, you know, preaching and getting people to go out in droves and preach the gospel. Where is the older generation? Where are they? You can't control what other people do, but you can control what you do. And you may be young right now, but don't forget 
how important this is and don't ever allow yourself to get into that mindset of saying I'm retiring from it all we listed all the battles last week that could cause a person to get pretty weary a lot of fighting Joshua didn't give up not even to the very end he stuck with it he is the great example of how we ought to live our Christian life going from battle to battle to battle and how many times just as with Moses we see with Joshua what whatsoever the Lord commanded him that he did no matter what it was they're just going through and doing and doing and doing and filling the word the whatever the word of the Lord was to him that's what they do and um, never stopping so we need to need to keep that in mind even when Joshua's old the Lord saying hey you got more work to do let's keep reading here let's uh, let's jump down now to verse number 13 or verse, let's start reading in verse number 12 because this is this is again he's, he's talking about you know the half tribe of Manasseh and, and you know the Og the king of Bashan and these people that were already defeated Verse 12 says, All the kingdom of Og and Bashan, which reigned in Ashtaroth and in Edrei, who remained of the remnant of the giants, for these did Moses smite and cast them out. Nevertheless, the children of Israel expelled not the Geshurites nor the Maacathites. But the Geshurites and the Maacathites dwell among the Israelites until this day. Now, this becomes a thorn in the flesh of the children of Israel because. As you recall, their job, what they were told to do when they went into the promised land was to destroy everybody. Everyone was supposed to be killed. Now, we already saw the issue with, um, oh, what was the name of the, the people that came in and made a, tr a truce with them? The Gibeonites, thank you. I'm thinking Gilead, and I'm just like, it's not Gilead. I know it's not Gilead. Gibeon. The Gibeonites, they make a treaty with the children of Israel. That, this is not who that's talking about. These are other people that they just never ended up de defeating and destroying. And you, we're, we'll see some of those battles later on. We'll see you know, how they just failed, they couldn't do it for various reasons. And, uh, and they end up just, just sticking around and being a problem. And just to show you the impact that this has, I, I studied this out and I just learned this recently studying for this sermon. I thought this was this is really interesting. All looking up all the references to Geshur, to who Geshur was, because the Geshurites that remain, it's one of the people that remained in the land. And turn if you keep your finger here, we'll come back to Joshua. Turn if you go to 2 Samuel chapter number three. You'll see what an impact the children of Israel not eliminating all these people out of the land ahead on King David's life. 2 Samuel chapter number 3. We're going to read here, starting in verse number 2, where it starts going over David's sons that were born to him. It says, And unto David were sons born in Hebron, and his firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and his second Chiliab of a Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, and the third, Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. Now, right off the bat, well, there's a lot of problems here with David. I think David's a great character in the Bible. He's someone that we can learn a lot from, someone to look up to in many, many, many areas, but uh, especially in the fact he had a heart that was, you know, after, a heart after the heart of God. And, and, you know, he did a lot of great things, but he also definitely had his flaws. And one of his flaws, that he's, he married multiple wives. He had multiple wives. And, you know, another thing to just be aware of and to be careful of, especially as you start to have families and children, is that whatever sins you have in your life, be prepared for your children to, to have that same sin and, and multiply and be even worse than what you are. Be careful what you dabble in. Be careful what you allow to come in and just be, I'm okay with this sin. Because when your children see that, they're going to say, oh, well, if that was okay for dad, then I'm going to go all in. And that's what Solomon did. 
David had some, you know, seven wives or whatever, ten wives, you could count them up. And then you have Solomon having thousands. Solomon just going and just, just going crazy with it. Well, David had, had wives that were of the, the children of the land unto whom they, weren't, they were by law bound. They're not supposed to be given their daughters unto in marriage. Yet David had them, and now look what happened. And we read about David's children, what happened to him. His firstborn, that was the, the, the wife, his wife was a Jezreelitess, and that was Amnon. And what did Amnon end up doing? He ended up, you know, forcing his sister Tamar, his half-sister Tamar. And then as a result of that, now remember, David's first wife was Michal, the daughter of Saul. And he was happy. I mean, that was, that was a great marriage for him. He was happy to be married to her. But of course, when Saul started attacking him, he went out on the run. And instead of just remaining faithful to his wife during the course that he was out, you know, on the run, on the lamb, he ends up picking up these other wives. We see that. And he doesn't even have, he never ends up having a child with Michael. And that's a shame because I think things would have turned out a lot better for him had he done that. But he didn't. He, he ended up marrying all these various wives and um, has children with them, which, of course, hurts his relationship when he finally comes back together. I mean, what's Michael going to think? Oh, you married these other people. Now you have children with them. You know, they never had a chance to have children. And now he's, he's coming back with kids and everything else. That's got a devastate her. Amnon forces his sister, his firstborn. And then, on top of that, David didn't even deal, really, with what his son had done. He just kind of looked the other way. Didn't do anything about it. And that burned um, Absalom up. He couldn't, he's like, you know, if dad's not going to do anything about it, then I will. And, of course, he ends up killing Amnon. And then he goes on the run. Turn, if you would, to chapter 13 in 2 Samuel. But we see already, though, Absalom is the son of Maacah, which was a daughter of Talmai. And Talmai was the king of Geshur. Talmai shouldn't have even existed. Let alone his daughter that gave birth to Absalom, that David married. Talmai is Absalom's grandfather. And it's one of David's father-in-laws. That's, that's how close this Geshurite is to, to David and his family. His son is, is partially a Geshurite. And in verse uh, 37 of 2 Samuel 13, the Bible says, this is, this is after Absalom kills Amnon, and he goes on the run, where he goes and hides out, well, he runs back to, to Grandpa. And hangs out in, in that town and says, But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, the king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. So he's spending a lot of time among the Geshurites. And then what happens when Absalom comes back? Tries to overthrow the kingdom, right? Tries to win over the kingdom by flatteries. And he even says, and I don't think I have this in my notes, but. He even says to his father, right when he's, right when he's ready to do like the overthrow and kind of get everyone um, on his side and, and plan his coup, he says, oh, let me, you know, let me go and, and, um, and do these sacrifices because when I was in Geshur, I made this vow that if the Lord brought me back to Jerusalem, then I, then I would, then I would you know, perform these sacrifices unto the Lord. And, and how wicked, Right? I think when he was in Geshur, I think he was partially telling the truth there in the sense that, yeah, he might have made a vow, but that he was going to then take over the kingdom because his dad wasn't fit. His dad didn't take care of the problem when his sister was forced. He had to take care of business. When he flees, he says, you know what? If I ever make it back there, then I'm going to become king. My father doesn't deserve to be king anymore. And he probably made that plan when he was back in Geshur. And then when he finally does come in, he's saying, oh, wait, no, I have to go pay my vows to the Lord. And that's what he uses to go 
and, and gather up all the people that he's already persuaded to come to his side and, and go in and, and take over the kingdom. But turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 7. I just want to show you this aspect of the law to the children of Israel. I mentioned it briefly, but I just want to show you the reference. Deuteronomy chapter 7. We see, one, the Gishorites shouldn't have even been remaining unto, the, unto that day because they should have been wiped out. But then, two, David should, had no business marrying the king of Geshur's daughter. Deuteronomy 7, verse number 1, the Bible says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and thou hast cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Notice the warning. He says, when you start taking wives of the children of the land, he says, they will turn away thy son from following me. David took this wife. Now, that wife didn't turn his heart from following the Lord. But that wife, what, what happened to Absalom? Now, we don't see him specifically serving false gods, but we definitely see him not honoring his father and, and committing all you know, wicked sins against, against David. And it says, um, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you. But see, I... I it wouldn't be that far-fetched to think that Absalom was serving other gods. We don't know that, though. I can't say that, 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 you know, that he actually did that because I don't have the evidence for it. But the Bible says here, So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. Now, David found mercy in the eyes of the Lord, but he definitely reaped a lot of punishment from, from everything that he had done and the sins he committed and the sins of his son as well. I believe that you know, a lot came back down upon him as a result of that. Now turn, if you would, to chapter 17 in Deuteronomy. David had no business, one, marrying any other wives, two, especially marrying a wife of the, the Gesherites. But we're seeing in Deuteronomy 17 about even being a king, having a special rule. Like, everyone, no one was allowed to have multiple wives. It was not endorsed by God. I'm saying it was allowed, I suppose, because it wasn't necessarily against the law for your average person. God has aspects of the law in there if someone does multiply wives. It's not what God intended. It's not what God wanted. But he didn't make it a crime, like a criminal offense, to marry multiple wives. But what the Deuteronomy says here for the king is that the king is not supposed to multiply wives to themselves. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse number 15. The Bible says, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not, he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. And this is exactly what Solomon did, by the way. Solomon ended up multiplying horses and got horses from Egypt. It's how, you know, it was part of his great uh, army of, of you know, chariots and horses that he had. He caused his people to go back in Egypt to buy horses for him. It's exactly what he did. It says, For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, you shall henceforth return no more that way. Look at verse number 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. David had no business marrying multi multiplying wives. You know, when you have a second wife, you've added a wife. When you have seven, ten, you're in multiplication now. That's, that's not, 
You're, you're no longer just adding one. You're, you're, you've gone well beyond that, and you're in multiplication. And, um, and it, was, it was wrong. It was, it was one of the failures of David. But you know what? It's good that God lets these things be told for us. One, to not lift a man above that, that he ought to be lifted up to. And two, to help us to see these things, you know, the repercussions for sin. And we could see it play out and we could hopefully learn from the examples of others. It's way better to learn from someone else's mistakes than from your own. You don't want to have to go through it. You see someone else do it and say, that's good enough for me. I don't want to go through that. Let's go back to, uh, to Joshua, Joshua chapter 13. It's probably going to be a little bit shorter sermon tonight. There's just a few things, a few points I really want to cover. Joshua chapter 13. We keep reading more about Moses giving the inheritance to, the, to, the, to Reuben and um, lists off the various cities. But then we get down to verse number 21. The Bible says, And all the cities of the plain, and all the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites, which reigned in Heshbon, whom Moses smote with the princes of Midian, Evi, and Recham, and Zer, and Hur, and Reba, which were dukes of Sihon dwelling in the country. Balaam, also the son of Beor, the soothsayer, did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain by them. Now, I want to pause and, and just give a little bit of a, of a summary of, of Balaam. Because Balaam is a very interesting character in the Bible. It's a, it's a very interesting story. What happens with Balaam? And, uh, you know, he's famous probably because Balaam's ass speaks to him. You remember the story. He's, um, and, and Balaam could be a little bit confusing too. Because in the beginning of the story, everything looks like Balaam's a good guy. He's a prophet. He says, you know, oh, I'm only going to say what the Lord tells me. I can't say anything else. You know, I don't care what you give me. I will not say anything other than what God tells me. And that's what I'm going to do. And he seems pretty firm on it. But there's a couple things that as you read the story, you're thinking like, well, that's kind of weird. What, why is it like that? We're, we're one, like, why did God want to kill him? Why was the angel standing in the way as he was on his way to the king to, to curse Israel? Why, why was the angel there when we, it, seeming, it seemed like God said, hey, go, go with them? Well, we're going to turn to that story. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 22. You see, Balaam said a lot of the right things, but his, one, his heart wasn't in it. His heart was not there, and you can prove that from Scripture. I'm going to prove it to you now. One of the things that we saw in Joshua, it says that Balaam, also the son of Beor, the soothsayer. There's a little bit of evidence that Balaam really wasn't a good guy. So I don't know what a soothsayer is. Well, think about wizards, magic, Necromancy, all these things that are mentioned in Scripture and talks about, you know, oh, you shall not sh suffer a witch to live. And anyone who's, who's, who's um, involved in the, in the dark craft or these dark arts and the magic and the witchcraft, it's the death penalty. God's just like, get them out of the land. It's wickedness. So that's who Balaam was. He's a soothsayer. He's a tarot card reader. He's a palm reader. He's a psychic, whatever you want to call it. That's what he's into. He's into soothsaying. But let's look at the story here in Numbers chapter 22. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. So see, that sounds good, right? He said, yeah, it's right on. You tell him. I'm not going to do anything unless God tells me. Verse number 20. Now he hears from God. Because you know, these people are trying to get him to go with them to go to Balak. And he says, well, I'll ask God. We'll see what God says. Otherwise, I'm not going to do it. Verse number 20. God actually comes to Balaam. So now, you know, again, when you, when, I don't know about you, at least when I start reading this, you start thinking like, well, wow, God's actually talking to this guy. He must be a prophet. I mean, God's talking to him, right? 
Look at verse number 20. It says, And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt, that shalt thou do. So that second part there where he's saying, hey, only what I tell you, that's what I want you to do. We see Balaam basically like repeating that phrase. So we're thinking, hey, he's right in line with God. But the first part of that verse, it says, if the men come to call thee, rise up. So he's saying if those people that were come, if they actually come back to your house and call for you to come, then go with them. But look at what Balaam does in verse 21. It says, And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. He didn't wait for them to come and call him. He's just like, all right, I got the okay, let's go. And he goes, and that's why God got, gets mad with him. That's why there's the angel standing in the way. And when Balaam gets, gets mad at the donkey sitting on because he's ramming him into the wall because he's trying to get around this angel that the, that the donkey could see, the ass could see him standing there. And he's got his sword drawn. And, he's just, you know, and he starts hitting the, the ass, and the ass is just like, God gives this miracle, the ass is able to speak with a man's voice, and actually talks to Balaam, and is just like, you know, what have I ever done wrong to you? Why are you hitting me? And what, what I love about the whole story is that, it's like Balaam doesn't even bat an eye, that his donkey's just talking to him. He answers him right back, and just like, what are you doing, you know? It's not even a big deal that, that his ass is just sitting there talking to him. But, but then, of course, he finds out, he's like, oh, you know, I'm sorry, God, I'll go back. What do you want me to do? You know, but, but this, the, um, his mindset and where his heart is, he cared about the reward. He honestly cared about the reward. He didn't listen to what God said to do. He just, just, he got so excited when he heard that from God that he just went and did it. He didn't actually obey what God told him. He was greedy of the reward because he was a false prophet. Now, just from this story, it's not always easy to understand. Now, the evidence, I think, is still there. We see evidence in Joshua. It says he's a soothsayer. But the, the biggest evidence that we have is in the New Testament. And um, in 2 Peter chapter 2, as well as in the book of Jude, Balaam is referenced. And if you know the Bible at all, you know that Jude and 2 Peter 2 are parallel passages, both of them referencing false prophets. And that's what they're talking about. It's about, you know, men who've crept in unawares, they're reprobate, they're teaching damnable heresies. I'll read for you from verse number 15 of 2 Peter 2. The Bible says, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. So the Bible is clearly saying out here that all, in the previous 14 verses in 2 Peter chapter 2, it's referring to the same group of people. And it's saying these people, they're just following the way of Balaam. And you could take the time later to read the rest of that, that passage and see you know, the earlier verses. Saying they're following the way of Balaam who loved the wages of unrighteousness but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. And then it says in the next verse, These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. These, that, you know, that's including Balaam and the people that follow Balaam. They're wells without water, clouds carried with a tempest to whom is reserved the mist of darkness forever. In Jude verse 11, the Bible says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. We see that, that what Balaam did is that he really just wanted that reward. He wanted the money. He wanted the reward from the king. He said the right things, but he really was greedy inside and wanted that reward. I mean, why else would he try to curse the children of Israel three times? How many times does God have to tell you something before you're going to say, all right, I believe it. God said it already. But three times the king saying, no, no, come on over here and take a look at him from over here and curse him for me. And he's like, okay, well, I'll just see what God says this time. You know, the first time he goes, he already knows God doesn't want to curse him. So he goes the first time. 
And, and he, you know, he has them build these seven altars and they go into the high place and all this other stuff. And he's using enchantments to try to communicate with God. And God gives a blessing on the children of Israel. So then Balak gets angry. He's like, no, 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 no. I, I need you to curse him. And instead of Balaam just going, no, I'm not going to ask again because he just told me that it, they're being blessed. And God's not just going to change his mind and start cursing him when he just blessed them. He goes, all right, well, let's see what God says this time. Because he knows that if he gets the right answer, that, that the answer that Balak wants, he's going to get a big reward. So he goes to God three times. And we know, you know, in the third time he did it, this is recorded in Numbers 24, verse 1. It says, And when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not as at other times to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. So the other times that he was going to the Lord, he was using enchantments. So we see here, he's a soothsayer. He's using enchantments. This is the way he's trying to communicate with the Lord. It's like he's having a seance, trying to get in contact with the Lord. He's a wicked guy. And then at the end of the day, because the Bible even says in, in Deuteronomy 23, verse 4, it tells us that God would not listen to Balaam because Balaam wanted to curse him. And he turned the curse into a blessing. That if, if, if it were up to Balaam, Balaam would have just cursed him and, and taken that reward. But God actually wouldn't let him. And it's interesting where we see the only times you really see God like not allowing things and just totally using people, it's with the reprobates. He lifts up Pharaoh. He won't even allow him to let the children of Israel go until he's, until he's done what he wanted to do. We don't see God using and like kind of controlling people who are not reprobate that way. He leads people, but, but the reprobates, it's like he'll just... He won't, he won't allow certain things with them. And, and he definitely wouldn't allow this with, um, with Balaam. In Deuteronomy 23, 4, I'll read the verse for you. It says, Because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam. It means he wouldn't listen to him. But the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee because the Lord thy God loved thee. Balaam wanted to curse him. And again, that's from the Old Testament too. There's plenty and plenty and plenty of evidence saying that Balaam was not a good guy. And I don't know how anyone could preach that he was. I really don't. I mean, when you, when you, if you actually study it out, if you don't just take the first few verses or whatever in the story of him saying, no, oh, whatever God says, that's what I'm going to do. There's a lot of people that say that. There's a lot of people that say, oh, we love God doesn't mean they really do. And when Balaam could not curse the children of Israel and get his reward that way, what did he do? He still seeks to harm them. He counsels the people to commit fornication with the children of Israel. The Bible says in Numbers 31, verse 16, Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of, Lo of the Lord. Now, I'm not going to get into everything about the matter of Peor, but what happened was they were committing fornication with the, with the women of the land. And that was Balaam's doing according to number, Numbers 31, 16. The counsel, the advice of Balaam. So he wasn't able to curse them directly like from God. But by proxy, he's, tr he's trying to bring a, a curse against them by getting them into sin. Because he knows that, well, I can't curse them, so now I'll just try to tempt them and get them into sin, and then God will curse them. Because he's wicked. Let's go back to Joshua 13. We're going to finish up the chapter here. And what this does, I, I kind of was thinking about bringing in a map, but I haven't done enough of my own research 
to verify where all these cities were. And I don't, I don't trust what I find online. I really don't. I mean, there's, I think there's probably, there could, I mean, I think definitely think there could be some, some good information out there, but there's so much wrong and so much bad that I don't really trust. It. And I haven't had the time to go through. And I think it's a really, really interesting thing to do. It would be to map out because there's enough information in the Bible to give you a good idea of where everything is. And we still do have, I mean, modern day cities and stuff. There definitely is enough historical information to kind of figure out where a lot of these places are. Um, some people definitely have it way wrong, but it's not that, I don't think it'd be overly difficult to figure out like where everything is, where the borders should be and, and the way everything <coughs> looks, but you kind of get the feel for it. You, could, you can see the, um, just from reading, like the Gishurites and these people that they weren't able to drive out, that was just, they, went, they were like right at the border of, um, of the land that was given unto Judah that was, you know, the people that were defeated when Moses was, st was still fighting on the other side, Jordan. So like, why couldn't they have just gone further and, and defeated them? You know, they, they left them go. We'll, we'll get into that when we get into those, those battles. But um, it's, it's amazing to me. I don't know, but there's... Um, We'll cover this. We'll, we'll read the, the last few verses here. Verse number 31 says, And half Gilead and Ashtaroth and Edrei, cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan, were pertaining unto the children of Maker, the son of Manasseh, even to the one half of the children of Maker by their families. These are the countries which Moses did distribute for inheritance in the plains of Moab, on the other side Jordan by Jericho eastward. But unto the tribe of Levi, Moses gave not any inheritance the Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he said unto them. And when we get to chapter 18, I'm going to go more in depth on the children of Levi and, and why they didn't get inheritance and stuff like that, because that's also, there's, some, there's a few verses in, in this whole book that talk about the Levites. That's, that's another interesting study. But that'll be for another day. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. And, and when we really study some of this stuff out, how interesting it really is, Lord, and... and um, even just learning about the Geshurites and, and the, the problems that that caused with David and his family and, and all those issues. They weren't the sole cause, but they definitely um, were a big, a big problem for him, dear Lord. And they, they did end up being a snare for him. Lord, help us to learn how to keep your word and keep it fully. Not partially, but, but take it to its end. Not serve you with half of our heart, but want to hold on to some sin. Not get, try to get just some of this in our life, but get it all out. Lord, help us to, to eliminate all the wickedness and, and everything within us, Lord, that we don't have that remnant left that's just going to cause us a pain in the flesh. And I know we're not perfect and we still have this flesh, but God, just help us to win victory after victory every single day of our life, dear Lord. Help us to maintain the strength and the integrity to keep moving forward with your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.